As we know, Greek mythology claims that the Trojan War began due to a rivalry between three goddesses. However, modern historians such as Eric H. Klein do not accept divine interaction to be the cause of the Trojan War. The ancient Greek historian, or historian, Herodotus even argued against Helen ever having set foot in Troy. With so many different theories floating around, we are forced to ask ourselves, what was it that the Greeks and Trojans were actually fighting for? Now I'm going to answer this in a number of different ways, or having a look at a number of different theories. First we'll have a look at Herodotus, the ancient Greek historian, and then we'll have a look at some archaeology, uh, as well as a debate over the archaeology of Troy before looking at contemporary theories and then I'll come to a final, a final conclusion. Now before we do all of that, I just wanted to briefly touch on uh, Homer and his Iliad. Homer was uh, an ancient Greek poet and through the Iliad he immortalized and framed this myth. Um, and he basically wrote about the events of Troy in his poem. Now during the Bronze Age, writing a poem was a perfectly viable way of portraying history. That was their medium. They didn't have cameras, they didn't have uh, the sort of technology that we have today, quite obviously. So it, was, it would have been taken as uh, truth and fact. Um, however, in the modern day, we need to consider um, a number of different things. Through lines um, such as this one in Book 1, page 496 and 497, Thetis will lament the reality of her son at war, doomed to a short life filled with heartbreak too. Uh, we can see that in this line there are a number of references to uh, godlike things, um, things that we know today uh, to not exist. So, first of all, Thetis uh, is the mother of Achilles, and she is supposed to be a nymph. And as far as we know today, nymphs don't exist. Um, Achilles was dipped in the uh, river Styx by Thetis, and this made his body, uh, all, all of the water that touched his body, um, his body became invulnerable, except for his heel, which his mother held onto him by. Um, now we know that such a thing doesn't exist. Um, there is no such thing as invincibility, um, and even and this was even proved when Achilles then died from being shot in the heel. However, that's also unrealistic because if you did get shot in the heel, you wouldn't die. You just go undergo a lot of pain. The only way you could die, having been shot in the heel, is through a lot of blood loss. Um, is all I could think of. So it's through uh, godlike fascinations um, that Homer had, and all of the Greeks would have had at the time, that we know we can't trust the Iliad as a historical source. We can understand, though, why Homer was writing these poems. He was writing, he was a man, and he was writing a poem for men. That was his audience, and uh, the actual poem itself was about men. So it was by a man, for men, about men. Because of this, he would have wanted to glorify um, how the battles went down. It was almost like, not quite propaganda, but as I said before, media for his audience. Um, why they should continue to go to battle, why it was such a glorious thing to do. It was not until Herodotus uh, that people started to question the Iliad. Um, now, Herodotus was an ancient Greek historian, or at least he tried to be a historian, but more or less most of his um, writings were told in a story-like fashion. Um, but he says his aims in story writing was to outline the causes of the conflict between Greeks and the Persians. Um, now, in conjunction with modern theorists, Herodotus rules out that gods play any part in the Trojan War, uh, and he questions the truth like of the Iliad. He wants to know how much truth there was. He actually argues that Helen never actually set foot in Troy. 
He believes that having left Sparta with Helen, Paris' ship encountered really bad weather and that washed them up uh, at the mouth of the Nile. From there, they were taken to Proteus, who was the pharaoh at the time, um, who was abiding in Memphis. And Proteus was absolutely outraged at the way that um, Paris had treated Menelaus in stealing not only his wife, but her dowry as well, and ruled that uh, Helen would stay in Egypt uh, until such a time as Menelaus would come to collect her, um, and Paris would have to leave. He said, I give you three days in which to leave my country and to find Anchorage somewhere else. If you're not gone by then, I shall treat you as enemies. Of course, Paris left, and he left the gold and the girl with the pharaoh, um, and he made it back to Troy safely. However, the Greeks did not know that Helen was in Egypt, so they turned up at Troy anyway, ready for a fight. They sent an envoy, which included Menelaus, th over to Troy. They met, and the Trojans said that Helen was in fact in Egypt. Uh, Menelaus didn't really believe this, and this would probably be for two reasons. One, well, Herodotus thinks that it was because it was just a folly excuse. And my reasoning would be that Paris is back that by then. So if Menelaus saw Paris safely at Troy, how come Helen wasn't there as well? So the war was fought, and after ten years, eventually the Greeks won the war and destroyed Troy, upon which the Greeks uh, were told the same thing by the Trojans. Helen is in Egypt. So they left, and Menelaus headed down with some of his Greeks uh, to collect Helen. Um, now the irony kicks in here, and there will be a lot of irony in um, in my presentation. Uh, but having the war started over a guest um, treating his host ill, Menelaus uh, collected Helen and her dowry and try, uh, tried to leave Egypt, but he couldn't because of ill weather. So he decided to sacrifice uh, a couple of Egyptian children to the gods um, in return for good winds. Unfortunately, the Egyptians weren't too happy with that, so they got uh, ruled as enemies of the state. Menelaus is a bit of an idiot. Now, the only uh, flaw in this uh, recounting of what happened is that Herodotus, um, his source is an Egyptian priest who claims to have met uh, with Menelaus himself. So, unfortunately, we can't completely trust it. Um, but he does have a logical reasoning for why uh, he accepts it rather than going and trying to find something else. Herodotus says, I am inclined to accept it for the following reason. Had Helen really been in Troy, she would have been handed over to the Greeks with or without Paris' consent. For I cannot believe that I, either Priam or any of any other kinsman of his was mad enough to be willing to risk his own and his children's lives for the, and the safety of the city simply to let Paris continue to live with Helen. That was in Herodotus, the Histories, page 174. Now this does make sense, but still, we need to question it. Um, the priest, uh, we don't know how much we can question the priest, uh, we can trust the priest. What, although, there is the issue that, sorry, there is the counter argument that written sources are just stories from other people. The only solid evidence you can find is archaeology, and even that is interpretation from modern historians. Nobody was actually there, so Herodotus's, um story is actually more or less on a same or equal level to some of the other archaeology that we've found um, in the modern day in Troy. The only problem being that there's no cross-reference um, of evidence that supports him. We do know, however, that Herodotus was quite aware um, that Homer's epic was just a story. 
He writes, I think Homer was familiar with the story, though he rejected it as less suitable for epic poetry. Examining archaeological evidence for, of Troy's existence can give historians insight as to why the Greeks and Trojans were fighting. In, in 1871, the millionaire Heinrich Schliemann discovered Troy, and he discovered it as located at the west end of what is known in the modern day as the Dardanelles, but uh, back in the ancient times it was known as Hellas Pont. Now, following Schliemann's original excavation, further archaeology revealed that there were quite a few different cities, the two of which um, that were built in that location that matched up or could match up with the Homeric Troy um, are known as Troy 6 and Troy 7A. Um, now, we'll have a look at this picture. And as we can see, both Troy 6 and Troy 7A were really large structures, or at least as far as we know. Um, and weapons buried in both cities indicate that they existed during the mid and late bronze period, so, mm, somewhere between um, 2020 BC through to even 1200 BC. Um, so there's quite a quite a long time period there, and that's about when Homer's Troy is supposed to exist. Um, and judging from the layers of soot, dust, and the burn marks on human skeletons that were discovered in Troy 7A, uh, we know that Troy 7A was in fact destroyed by a fire at some stage and then later sacked. Um, unfortunately, though, we don't know who it's who by. Um, but it, it wouldn't be unwise to think of those the people who did it as maybe being the Greeks. Um, the unfortunate thing about the sacking and the burning is that um, had it been the Greeks, they may have destroyed any texts that the Trojans had written about the war. Uh, Homer's, Homer's Iliad is written from a Greek perspective, and whilst it's not utterly biased, the the Greeks do win, and they do win through intelligence and cunning and things like that. I would have loved to see um, a Trojan written document on the Trojan War because that would have confirmed, first of all, it, we would have had a cross-reference for the fact that the Trojan War did actually happen, and second of all, it would have given us an idea as to the events of what happened. The beautifully uh, horrible thing about archaeology is that it's open to discussion. Uh, interpretations are always going to be different of what we see, and assumptions will have to be made. Um, in a recent debate that's occurred between uh, historians um, Manfred Kaufman and Frank Kolb, they're arguing over a couple of things. First of all, whether Troy was uh, Ulyssa, and second of all, uh, the size of Troy, Troy 6. Um, Manfred Kaufman argues that the archaeology and the Iliad were actually coherent. Um, Troy had been a large city with a thriving economy due to trade. Kaufman writes, if Troy at the height of its prosperity was allied with its main overseas trade partners and suppliers of goods, it becomes clear that in particular the harbour towns and surrounding peoples had a vital interest in the safety and continuing existence of a transfer point like Troy. Kaufman aligned this theory with the Iliad, saying, This network is thoroughly reflected by the catalogue of Trojan allies in the Iliad. Now, this is really uh, quite a solid assumption, and we'll go into the um, facts or the, the arguments of the facts in a minute, but we're just going to have to look at Frank Kolb first. So in rebuttal, uh, Frank Kolb accuses um, other historians as having what he calls the Iliad Syndrome, um, which is actually quite logical. Uh, so he thinks that the Iliad Syndrome is its basically a high, highly contagious disease um, among historians that causes them to align any archaeology they find with the Homeric description of Troy. It's a good point raised, but we also need to think that the reason why we're looking for Troy in the first place is because of the Iliad. So that is that is what historians are looking for, um, rather than finding Troy and um, 
maybe thinking about it might not be all that uh, Homer cut it out to be. So Kolb, Kolb actually had a look at Kaufman's findings um, where he found, uh, Kaufman found in Troy 6 that there was a lower ditch um, which ran around what he thinks was a lower city and was used for the purpose of defence. Uh, had this ditch been running around um, the city, it would have uh, protected, because it was about, it was over 100 metres away from the main city, it would have protected or housed some 10,000 people. Um, now, Kolb thinks that this is completely unrealistic because current cities at the time, such as Hattusa, only had 3,000, could only house 3,000 to 6,000 people. This is an ironic uh, defence mainly because Cold thinks it's outrageous because it would mean Troy would be so far ahead of its time, but in fact, that's what Kaufman is saying. Kaufman is saying that Troy was the Homeric version. It was large. It was better than anything else at the time. Um, so whilst, whilst Cold thinks that's outrageous, it's actually, um, it actually makes sense. However, Kolb does raise a good point. Um, he does see that the ditch was only 2 to 3 metres wide and only 1 to 1.5 metres deep. So if there had been a wall there, it couldn't have been as large and as impressive as the one described in the Iliad. It wasn't 10, 20 metres high. It, was, it barely would have been... Uh, five meters high, in fact, um, and it would have been knocked over quite easily. The the walls in the Homeric Troy lasted ten years, and even then they weren't actually destroyed. Well, they were destroyed, but that wasn't as a result of being the walls being defeated. It was as a result of people getting inside them and then destroying them. Um, so he raises a good point, and he believes that the ditch was used for irrigation rather than any sort of defense. It couldn't have been a moat. Um, Moats are much larger than that. There, you could walk over that sort of ditch, um, and it it probably wouldn't have had any sort of picket fence because that's a um, temporary defence rather than a permanent defence, which is what Kaufman was claiming. Kolb's theory of the ditch being used for irrigation um, supports his is is used to support his other theory that. Troy was just a poor farming village at the time and um, you had your a smaller sort of not not even a citadel just the village area where everyone else is proposing or all the other um, where Kaufman proposes the citadel is um, Cole believes that to be a smaller village center and around it um, where the lower city is he believes that to be just farmland um, with the irrigation ditch running around. Um, however, we have two more historians, um, Peter Jablonka and C. Brian Rose, who evaluate this argument um, between Kolb and Kaufman. One of, um, one of Kolb's reasons for thinking that Troy was just a poor city was because only shards of pottery were found in it. Um, there weren't whole, whole pots, um, and because of that he thinks that they weren't um, rich enough to purchase proper pots, but that's uh, kind of a silly thought because what shards mean is that the pot was just broken um, and scattered around the the city um, or, or just destroyed in general, uh, which would have happened quite possibly during the sacking of Troy um, as a looter does not take care in what they're sacking. They will just take whatever they can, and if they feel like destroying something, they probably will. Uh, we're going to have a look at Kaufman's uh, claims as what he believes is fact now. So he has um, three claims. First of all, he says, Late Bronze Age Troy, both Troy 6 and Troy 7A, were settlements um, that consisted of a citadel and a fortified lower city covering between 25 and 35 hectares. Um, now this is coming from the ditch that we spoke of earlier uh, and it, it does um, it is coherent with the archaeology if he is correct about his with his assumptions of the ditch being a wall. Um, 
It was, now number two, he says, it was by far the largest site in the triad, clearly at the top of the settlement hierarchy in the region. It can be, it can therefore be determined the capital of a city-state that encompassed the triad. Now the triad is the area of which um, we're in, and city-states were the way that countries operated then. Um, in Greece, you were just about close to seeing the city-states form um, completely um, in terms of Athens, Sparta, but at the moment they're all allied. Um, allied sorry. Um, and now his third claim is uh, that the finds, um, the unique geographical location of Troy and the evidence for contact between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean during the Late Bronze Age indicate that Troy played an important role in trade, um, which is backed up by quite a lot of um, historians uh, under that belief. Um, four more of them, um, Donald F. Easton, J. David Hawkins, Andrew G. Sherratt, and Susan E. Susan Sherratt uh, write, our findings are entirely congruent that Troy in the late Bronze Age had a citadel and a lower city appropriate to the capital of a significant regional power. It can almost probably be identified with Ulyssa. Um, consequently, we think that the criticisms raised against Professor Cor Kaufman by Kolb are unjustified. Now, what we have here is the majority of uh, historians believing that, or having the Iliad syndrome that Kolb says um, everyone has, so he's, he's quite right there, but that's probably all he's right about, to be honest. Um, the irrigation is a maybe, but uh, it is highly likely that it was a small wall and that Homer just glorified it. Um, in the way that Homer glorified a lot of things um, in his Iliad and made them sound bigger and more impressive. And as I was saying before, because Homer is a Greek, he would have wanted to make the Greeks sound quite, um, you know, make them sound better than they really were. So if, the Tro if Troy's walls were bigger and better in his Iliad, then, um, you know, it makes the Greeks sound better, all the more better for winning Troy. So whilst we haven't found a definite answer as to why the Greeks and Trojans were fighting, there are still several different theories that are in existence. Um, and we've discussed some of them, but I'm just going to reiterate. So first of all, Troy's location allows for a very strong economic base. Um, it was a contemporary masterpiece, and it was positioned at the gateway of, the, of Hellespont, the Dardanelles. Uh, which is a historical um, area for battles. We've seen Gallipoli fought over there, which was um, during World War One or Two. I've forgotten. Um, so I don't know my modern history that well, but um, it was basically fought over for for the Dardanelles. Um, and control of Hellespont um, would have allowed the inhabitants of Troy to tax vessels coming in and out. Um, through through there for a right to passage between the Black Sea and the Aegean. Um, this would have given them a lot of gold and the other thing that they could have done is if they didn't like someone who was trying to get through there they could have just taken their ships. Um, they would have had a navy and they would have been capable of dictating that whole area. Um, ships also taking refuge at Troy would have been able to trade their goods and resupplied, not to mention the protection that Troy offered from other pirates that weren't just Troy, the Trojan inhabitants being pirates. Um, with Troy also being a gateway through to Asia, the city would have been a real gem for King Agamemnon to win, so uh, it would have been a real strategical ma master move um, as part of a long-standing rivalry between the Greeks and the Hittites to overtake uh, Troy. And, and then effectively set up a base near the Hittites for the Greeks to come in and out of to attack them. Now this is drawn from Eric H. Klein. He, um, he says that Troy was a great plum for the Mycenaeans to capture and he also says 
This war may have been fought for the usual reasons, economic gain, greed, glory, territory, and control of trade routes. I like Eric, Eric H. Klein. He, um, he agrees with lots of the stuff I say. So um, we also are going to have a look at the English classical scholar, Moses Finley. Um, he theorizes in his paper, The Trojan War, guess what that's about, um, that the war was also part of a long-standing political rivalry between the Greeks and the forces in Asia Minor, in Asia Minor, the Hittites, um, and other various people. So uh, Finley finds that um, this is one of the theories that's consistent with the notion that the Greeks um, were the army who fought in the Trojan War, because it we we don't have solid evidence that say the Greeks are. Um, we just have the written sources of Herodotus and Homer who um, are claiming that that's who was part of the war, if there was a war. Um, but at the time of the war, uh, Troy was considered to be ruled by either the Luvians or the people of Ulyssa. If the Luvians had control, then it was known that they were vassals to um, the Hittites. Uh, which basically means that they were farmers who were given protection by the Hittites. So Frank Cole would have loved that theory. Um, and the theory of it being under control of Ulyssia, or even being Ulyssia, is, um, is backed by Homer, because uh, Homer uses Ilios and Ilium to describe Troy in his tale, and that's very similar to Ulyssia. Um, as, as you can hear um, in pronunciation. So it could have just been uh, the same city that they're talking about, but pronounced slightly differently um, in different dialects. Um, now, Hittite texts also designate this city to be north um, west of Turkey, which is where Troy's location is, roughly, because we don't have a, an exact pinpoint of where the Hittites say it is. Um, but these texts reveal that the Hittites had really strong alliances with Ulyssia and um, that if this was the case, Ulyssia um, possessed a lot of regional power and had control of the Dardanelles, as we've talked about, um, and, and the importance we've talked about earlier and the regional power of it being a city-state, they would have been allied. Um, so if the Greeks had attacked them, it would have really annoyed the um, annoyed the Hittites. Uh, Eric Klein also says that um, one can't really rule out that the war was fought over Helen, but at the moment we don't have any supporting data for that. So as we said before, we we do have the Iliad and we do have Herodotus the histories but they're not supported by archaeology and they're not supported by um, by other evidence other than themselves um, in terms of Helen. Uh, as uh, In terms of my own opinions um, and having a look at the opinions we have been given, uh, Mr. Finley, uh, his theories um, are indications or, or indications are closer to facts rather than based on just his personal opinion. Um, his theory also answers my question, uh, why, why did the Greeks burn the city and flee uh, if, they had, if they'd supposedly been fighting to win this city? Uh, and his, um, his theory is that the Hittites were actually coming, a large force of Hittites were coming to fight against the Greeks, which would have been quite scary for them. Um, but the only problem with that theory is that the Hittites weren't actually that far away that it would take them 10 years to march all the way to Troy. Um, now, if we have a look at uh, the archaeological debate that we were having before between Frank Kolb and um, Kaufman, I, I agree with um, Kaufman's findings as well. And um, here's why. Basically, um, Troy was most likely a large city with a dominant series of alliances due to trade, which in turn created a stable and high-ranking economy for their time. Now, why I think that is uh, we have a lot of historians saying it, first of all, 
um, and all giving different um, evidence as to why. Um, but also, the ancient Greeks, um, Homer and Herodotus, both seem to think that it was it was a very large city, um, quite impregnable or, or almost um, almost completely invulnerable. But um, we don't have any historians, um, ancient historians, saying that it was just a small farming town, um, even though it was probably glorified by Homer and Herodotus. Uh, there are, there's also suggestions that the Trojans spoke a language similar to that of the Hittites, who were in turn enemies of the Greeks. So as we've discussed before, they could be vassals or they could be allies um, to the Hittites. Um, and from this war, I'm inclined to accept that uh, the war occurred most likely for two reasons. Primarily for the rivalry between the Mycenaeans and the Hittites, and secondly, um, for Agamemnon to destroy Troy so to allow a free trade route through the Dardanelles. As I said before, why would they run? Um, why would they destroy it and run if they wanted to inhabit it? Um, and for, a, for such a city that seems quite impregnable, if you did win it, why wouldn't you just stay there and fight the Hittites when they came? The Greeks, it, the Greeks were not short on men. Um, that is for sure. They brought women over, uh, effectively inhabited the beach that they were staying. Um, so a lot of a lot of questions remain unanswered as of as of the moment. Um, and you know, from this, I believe that there is an element of truth that exists in Homer's Iliad. Um, the Trojans probably did steal the Greeks' gold, um, or, or Paris did, uh, or maybe it wasn't even through Paris. Maybe. Um, it was a, a trading cog that uh, a Greek trading cog had been, or, or a Greek fleet had been traveling through the Dardanelles and um, somebody allied with the Trojans or the Trojans themselves um, had attacked it and gained a lot of gold and then the um, Greeks wanted to come fight them. However, this would not have made uh, for a good tale um, for Homer. It's not it's not a viable reason a, for a war um, in his eyes. A viable reason for a war is love and romance and um, wrongdoing. Uh, it, it's a moral code, really, that um, Homer is writing about. So yeah, as I said, uh, in conclusion, I would believe that the war was fought as a long-standing rivalry um, and to clear up a trade route.